to another Quarantine Davis Talk. Today we have uh, CK Tan, who is the uh, co-founder of Batiste Data. Um, CK has been involved in databases for a, a long time. He's worked on some very, very uh, you know, influential and seminal systems. In addition to, to Greenplum, uh, when he was a master's student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison working with David DeWitt, he also worked on Shore, uh, the sort of the early OHP storage manager um, you know, it sort of predates a lot of the existing systems that are out there today, but had a lot of modern, uh, you know, modern database system technology in an academic project, which was a big deal. We also worked on Exodus, again, under, under the wit. So uh, Batiste Data has been around for several years now, um, and I first became aware of Batiste when they gave a talk at PGCOMP in 2014 that sort of laid out the column store, the LVM stuff that they were doing on top of Postgres, and to me, this, this really, you know, hit a, hit a sweet spot for me because this is all the things I want to do in the system we were building. So I'm, I, you know, I, it sucks that it takes a, it takes a quarantine, a pandemic to finally get CK to come give a talk at CMU, but still we're, we're super happy that, that he's here. So again, we'll do the same rules that we normally do. If you have a question, uh, just unmute yourself, say who you are, uh, where you're coming from, and then ask a question. So just interrupt him as, as we go along. Okay. All right, CK, go for it. Thanks, Andy, for those kind words. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm the founder of uh, Vitesse Data. We started in 2014 with another co-founder, uh, Feng Tian. Uh, we were both early engineers at Greenplum. Uh, we built up that product and then, uh, and then we left. <laughs> and in 2014, um, we read this uh, really influential paper by, paper by uh, Neumann, and we essentially redid the whole thing in Postgres. And, uh, you know, Q1 was like eight times faster, so we felt we had to start a company, and, and that's what that's what we did. Um, so eventually, um, at the at later time, Greenplum went pub uh, went uh, open source, so we moved the whole source code to Greenplum and uh, started this uh, Deep Green DB product. Um, um, commercially, we can talk about that. Uh, you know, if you guys are interested later, but um, let's focus on the technical part here. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how much time do I have? Oh. We'll go to like 5.30ish. Like, it, it, do you want to put it in present mode or you, you just go like this? Oh, let's go to present mode. Okay. All right. Here we go. Yeah. So here's the, the talk outline. Um, we'll talk about what is uh, the green DB and GPDB. Um, and then, and then we'll talk about you know the, um, the performance characteristics of uh, Deep Green DB. Um, we'll go into some source code and show you guys how ugly it can look. <laughs> um, and you know maybe it maybe it, it it's it's easy enough to to read. Um, and then there's some experiences that we picked up uh, after running the company uh, that I think may be um, very different from what students think. Uh, you know, especially in terms of transaction stuff, um, but we'll get get into that later. Okay, so let's go. So Deep Green DB is um, built on top of Greenplum, uh, open source Greenplum database. Um, we want to, from the get go, we want to maintain um, compatibility at the byte level. Uh, this because we think this is how you get customers, right? Uh, it is 100% compatible uh, at the byte level, uh, and uh, even with the binaries, you don't even need to change your program. Um, so what you do if you are a customer, you could take our binary, uh, shut down Greenplum, uh, swap in Deep Green DB, and start it up, and all your program should still work. And you know you would just notice the uh, speed up of some queries. Okay, so you don't have to move the data. You don't have to do any code changes to your SQL programs. PSQL still connects. Your OLD, uh, ODBC, JDBC, whatever, still function the same. Okay, um, so we address if inefficiencies in Greenplum in, in, in their computation, in their network layer, and some connectivity stuff. So compute, you know, essentially LLVM, um, Code gen in LLVM addresses that. Uh, network is is uh, it's kind of a you know for 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 database uh, um, 
engineers. Network is, is very different. Um, we'll talk about that too, and how Green Thumb implemented and how it was not uh, too good. Do you mean, and like, do you, by, by network you mean between nodes and not necessarily between the client? Yeah, between nodes. It, the interconnect, the interconnect. Got it. Yeah. So you need it, you know, very fast and, and uh, very optimized for, for big box, box sending of uh, data. Um, and then in terms of connectivity to S3, to all these other places that people really, really need now, uh, you know, to Kafka, to S3. Um, but you don't hear about Hadoop anymore, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> and I'll, I'll do a quick demo now, and just to show you guys how, how it does work. Let's see, it will be this guy. Okay, can you see? So, yes. so you just, you know, this is just uh, um, PSQL, connect to a database, and then it, it just looks like this. Um, let's see, so we do, let's show you the line item table, right? And it's just like normal Postgres. Uh, we can do a count star just to see the, the speed up, right? Count star from line item. Okay, we do it again, it's about 700 seconds. So how many seconds? Seven seconds to scale. This is a, um, by the way, this is a 20 gig TPCH line, line item. Um, so if you want to see the green plum speed, you just set the test enable zero. And you run it, same query. So that's, that's the difference about five times, right? And you can see, so this um, line item table is a columnar line item table with uh, compression on LZ4. And we so can- like Same query plan, same optimizer, all that- Everything the same. Plan. Yeah, and everything is the same. And then when you get to the physical plan, it, like it branches between Batiste and- Yeah, that. we'll talk about that later. Okay, yeah. okay. So uh, let's see, so we do Q1. I, I made a view out of it. So this is essentially TPCH Q1. I just do a select star from Q1. This is without uh, Vitesse, without the uh, code gen. This is a very boring demo. <laughs> Time for coffee. <laughs> uh, doesn't have to. It's about I think a few seconds more. There you go. Twenty-five seconds. Set Vitesse dot equal one. This is about five seconds. Yeah. So so that's the difference. About five five times on Q one. Um, okay. I think we should be okay now. Let's go back to this guy. We can come back to the demo if we have time later and do more. Um, so this is uh, the architecture of Green Plum and, and uh, Deep Green. Um, so what you have is some, uh, a distributed MPP with shared nothing architecture. Um, we have the master host here, and then you know all these are the slaves. Or, and uh, this, uh, each box here is a machine, right? So on each, on the master machine, you can you have one uh, primary Postgres instance. And then on the segment host, you can have half primary segments and half mirror segments. And so this, this primary segment may mirror this uh, secondary segment. Can you see the arrow? It's a bit small. Yeah, we, yes. Yeah. So, you know, like, like this uh, striping uh, backups, pairing. <laughs> Um, so, so, so the master gets the SQL and con and make up the plan, and then it distributes the plan to all the hosts to to work. Okay, and the standby master standby host is just there in case the master is down. And so then the, the P SQL would then connect to the standby uh, via some DNS magic or uh, you know depending on 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 the customer and how they do it. It may be maybe. Um, Manual, maybe by by uh, DNS. Okay, so let's 
text. Um, so this is a, in each segment host, we put in additional components. So this is a blow up picture of the segment host. Um, so in addition to Postgres instances um, for primary and mirror segments, we have something called xDrive. It's a component that we put in for connectivity. So these primary segments will connect to xDrive, which will then connect to you know, S3, S3 pool, or all these FPGA cards. Okay, and the thing to take away is it, it is stateless. So, you know, there's no concept of transaction, um, but you can connect to it and get data. So this might be getting into the weeds of Postgres, but like, are these foreign data wrappers? Or what, like, what does this look like? In the yeah, sort of, of uh, we have foreign data wrappers, um, um, adapters that would connect to it. It's just a network connection. But the network connection here is um, um, the the protocol is 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 how do I put it? It's it's uh, it's built for transporting data, right? So it's not just it's not built for very chatty stuff. It's for building to send a big chunk of stuff. And the the stuff that goes between the primary segments and the X drive, they're all column columns, um, you know, vectors of columns. Okay. Okay, and you know the S3 pool will is uh, essentially a local disk cache. So if you if, if if we can avoid going to hit AWS if we find it in the local cache, uh, I think you can find uh, more talk about this in in Snowflake, and they do something like this too. Right. So going to S3 all the time is very expensive, but if you have a local cache, it's faster and and it's also less expensive. So when you say stateless, again, so like it's like the query shows up. If you're touching mm -hmm. the foreign data wrapper table, then the query plan gets shoved down. To the segments? Yeah. And then... Uh, yeah. So here in the segment, it, it will just be a connection to xDrive and say, you know, give me this file. Give me the list of files. And then um, we will hash them and select those that map to this primary, this segment. And then we just do a scan on on those files. But like, what is like if it's if it's just hey, give me this file. The, the, what is the FPGA actually doing then, right? Because it's if it, you wanted to say ah, scan this right. data and do this predicate, right? No, this is a general X drive is a general um, interface. So there are it it supports all these other um, external data. So you know you could do what what it so the the. Uh, what it does is allow you to mount a logical disk. Okay, so one of the disk may be your S3 um, pool. The other disk may be your local files, right? It's it's a mount. So you you in the config file you specify you know a mount by this name. Yeah, is connecting to S3 or is connecting to uh, Kafka or is connecting to uh, S3 pool, and you you can write. Um, you can write plugins that that would get called based on those mount, mount points. But but are you doing predicate pushdown when you would want to use the the FPGA? Yeah. So okay. there's something called um, um, Fung wrote something that would that would have a simple executor like syntax. Okay. That you can push push things down into the FPGA. Okay. Um, cool. You know, essentially we're just scanning files here. So you know it's filters and it can do some X if you uh, if you have um, uh, you know bigger FPGA cards. Um, so a little bit more about interconnect. So interconnect is is really really crucial. Um, you know in a small setup you probably won't see it, but um, when you when you scale big then it it becomes a, a bigger and bigger problem every day. Um, so remember Postgres is a it's not threaded, right? So each process needs its own co connections, TCP connections everywhere, right? So if you have something like this, you know, ten machines with eight segments per machine, and you know, we have your query has three three joins, and each join has uh, distributions under them, motions or exchanges under them, then you know you need to make a lot of connections per. Postgres uh, executable, right? 
So each of them may be connecting to, if you, if you just multiply it, it's like 2,000 connections per machine per query. So if you have 10 queries, you know, it's 20,000 connections per machine per query. And eventually that becomes, uh, TCP would not be able to handle it. And so eventually, Greenpound switched to TC UDP. Um, but then, you know, we are database engineers, right? So we don't really write very good <laughs> network codes. Um, the implementation in, in Greenpound has a network window of one, right? And then it times out and then it resets if it doesn't get the act within one second. And when you have a lot of some not even under not even a lot if when you have some packet loss you could have a huge delay in your query uh, and that happens just when the system is busiest right and yeah, that's it's not very very good um, and also in in green plums interconnect the data flows only one way there's no uh, the protocol doesn't allow for you to send any kind of hints uh, we'll see it's it's quite a big big improvement here from the receiver to the sender so you know, in, when you're building a hash table, once you have the left side, when once you have built up the hash table, you can essentially compute a a bloom filter and send it to all the scans and say, you know, don't send me these tuples that will never join, right? And that that has a huge effect on some of the queries, just because you avoid a lot of the network. So, uh, so you're saying here with. That like with, with the, this is like the way Greenplum currently works. Yep. That you can't do these things, and then the next slide, I guess, is how you made it better. Yeah, we did. We we yeah, 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 addressed okay. all this stuff, right? Okay. And so we have something called Deep Mesh uh, and Interconnect uh, that we uh, that uh, Xiao Yan, who is an ex Cisco engineer, built for us. Um, so here we have TCP connections between hosts. So between hosts, there's there's just TCP connection. So in the case. Previous case, you have 10 machines, you have you know, 100 connections in total between the, between the machines, right? And inside the host, everything is Unix domain. And, and then we built, we also, so that's, you know, that's really pretty good in, in uh, reducing um, all these um, uh, collisions and, and packet loss. TCP does, does, a, does a good job. <laughs> and, um, and then between deep mesh, the agent and the segments, we have Unix domain, which is uh, pretty fast too. So that's that's how we address it. Okay. Um, okay. So here is the uh, performance numbers on TPCH. Um, we just did this on some machines on on uh, in Alibaba. Um, here is a speed up compared to open source green plum, uh, 12 billion rows line, type, line item table. Um, we have enough one one primary one one uh, mass primary machine and four uh, segment hosts, and each host runs 12 uh, 12 segments. I mean, meaning 12 uh, Postgres instances, right? And it's stored in, in column store with LZ4 compression and runs on deep, deep mesh. And the disk, disk speed is six gigabyte per second and our network is, is a bit slower there compared to uh, AWS. Um, so on average, we're about three times faster. And you can see from this table here, um, you know, Q1, just the one that we did just now is five times because you know, there's very little network traffic there. So we can see, we really see the speed up compared to just you know what I did on my local disk here there. Um, so I want to highlight Q1, uh, Q5, and Q17 in in this talk. Um, I think they they show most of the um, improvements that that we see. Greenplum by default is it a comms or a row store? It supports everything. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, th so th this is Vitis column store compared to Greenplum column store? Uh, no. Uh, the only thing we add there is LZ4 compression. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They don't have that. Any questions on the performance numbers? Or? Nothing that jumps up? <laughs> I, I, 
it's not it's non not surprising, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's good. Some of those uh, the small improvements, some of those small improvements are on queries that runs really fast. So if the query runs really fast, then your compilation price is um, is a much bigger percentage of that the of, of the whole speed up. So so you see one point something when when uh, the query is really really, really fast. Is this using the like the Orca um, optimizer? Uh, or no. Okay. No. I mean, this talks not not about that, but like in general, do you see customers using Orca, or is it always just using? You know, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Yeah. So let's okay. So how do we code gen, right? So um, yeah. So we wanted to maintain hundred percent compatibility. So if you build a database from the grounds up, there's no way you can build everything in day one, right? So what we wanted to do is uh, we would use uh, the regular Green Plum or Postgres code as backup. So what happens is you submit a query, uh, it goes to the Postgres SQL parser, it generates the uh, AST tree. It, it will you know, optimize it. And then it gives you the plan tree, right? And you feed the plan tree to Vitesse JIT. And then we determine if we want to JIT it or not, or if, if we can JIT it or not, right? If there are some uh, constructs that we don't support, then or you know, if the query runs really fast and you know, JITing would not be economical, then we just kick it to the uh, Postgres side. It, it will just run the normal path. And if we if we determine that we want to JIT it and we can JIT it, then we you know run our executable, which is essentially just you know a call to a function now, since you have already JIT the the new function. What does your JIT look like? Are you are you generating the IR directly, or you have like an intermediate DSL? I, IR direct. Okay. Yeah. So the code the code is coming. Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> code is coming. Yeah. So so. So during this step in the middle here, the Vitesse JIT step, this is what we do, right? So we have some quick heuristics to determine if, if you know, it's just an index scan on the primary key on, on a filter, then we just kick back to the, to the um, old, to the um, regular executor. Because code gen could take 50 to hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, if you run a single, um, single row select on a B3 primary index, it's going to be less than, you know, one millisecond. So it doesn't, yeah, jitting will, will absolutely kill it, right? Um, and then we convert this, the Postgres plan tree to the Vitesse plan tree in C++, okay? So, you know, if there are any plan nodes you know, that we don't yet, we haven't yet coded, then we just back out and give it to Postgres again. Okay, so, so some plan nodes like, I don't know some more exotic ones that we don't we don't have it yet. We would just give it to back to Postgres. Um, so then we call you know um, the code gen on the Vitesse plan tree, and essentially the design is is what was outlined in the Newman paper. You have producer and you have consumer, and they they generate um, and push the tuple up right, and uh, the scan node so on. So if you if you know in Postgres the tuples are all serialized, and the code to to extract attributes out of the tuple uh, is a general purpose code. And if you profile if you profile, profile the Postgres uh, code, you'll see it shows up um, very often, very high in the, in the, in in the in the cost tree. Um, in our case, the scan node will actually generate a customized record serializer for those tables. You know, if you are, and you know, because we know exactly uh, which attribute is at which position, there's no more decision. The decisions were all made during code gen, and at runtime, you would just be um, um, going directly to those bytes and retrieve them and store them in, in registers. Um, I have a note here that says, except really white table, right? Really white table and it's, it's problematic because when we load into LLVM, we load into LLVM registers. And if you have a thousand attributes, a thousand integers, I'm going to need a thousand registers, 
right? A thousand re- you don't find a thousand registers in in anywhere in the world, right? So so those get actually gets backed into storage, and then you'll see that uh, performance degrade. Uh, and there is some again some heuristics that we determine at, at which point that we don't generate the custom serializer and we back out to use the um, the uh, Postgres serializer, uh, deserializer. Okay, and then uh, when we generate the code, there are nested plans are also su- also supported. So essentially, there is a new when there's a new context that's created for each level, and um, if you have a nested plan, you just create a new context and then you ask that context to to gen- code gen and things will be separate. Um, so one thing to note about C and C++ here is we ran into some trouble at first <laughs> just because um, some programmers prefer to, to write C++ code. But Postgres is all in C. So in, in Postgres, um, especially during error handling, they have a, when they, they do set jump and long jump, right? So if you, if you call into C and they do a set jump before they do all this work, and then you call into C++, and if you encounter an error, if you call the Postgres e-log, which is an error reporting uh, function, it will do a long jump back to the, to the point where it does the, the set jump. Um, if you, so in between those, when it does a long jump back, you lost all the um, stack on C++, right? So C++ would not be able to roll back and free up uh, memory. So you would have memory leaks all over the place. Uh, and you don't see it unless you run into trouble. So yeah, it's very important to, to keep the two things separate. So the, for, uh, we're actually hitting, we actually hit the exception problems with LLVM yesterday uh, or today when we fixed it. All, all the archives in C++, so I feel your pain. Um, the, the nested query plan part, like this would be like a sub plan in, yeah. in the query plan tree. You basically say, you just say, all right, it's a whole new plan. You don't try to inline anything. You just compile it separately. Yeah, separately. It's a function call. We just okay. call it. Okay. Yeah. C++ is getting scary. <laughs> I, I, I actually... Not that it matters, but like, are you? I mean, you started writing this in 2014, so it's presumably it's C plus plus 11. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, but we stick to very minimal C plus plus. We we started writing C plus plus in Shaw, right? Before it it, yeah. it was just a templatizer. <laughs> yes. Now, now it's 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 pretty scary. I you know I I got scared looking at those codes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so here's some some code gen stuff. So you know, in 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 um, um, Postgres, you see all this um, in four plus. In, uh, this is yeah, in for, in you know, plus minus multiply div- division, right? Of uh, uh, abstract data types here. Uh, here's our code to to generate them, and this, these are all generated. So this is, uh, you see the thirty two and thirty two, thirty two and sixteen. So this is in four two plus is adding four byte integer with two bytes integers, right? And all calls this function to generate the um, LLVM code. And then this is, this is that worker function. Um, so the first line, you know, it just normalized the arguments. And then we get the type. Um, and then depending on the bit width, we do we, we limit the bit width to 16, 32, and 64, right? And then we have uh, ignore the di- ignore the uh, division and mod here first. Let's look at the ad- additions, right? So additions, we just call JIT as add overflow, right? The, the two with the two parameters. And then we retrieve the value and the overflow bit. And we generate code to, to check the overflow bit and also to check if the Error is not is null uh, if the um, if the return value is null. So we always do the addition no matter whether it's null or not. Okay, since it's, it's fast enough, 
an additional check in front of it doesn't really really help. I mean, you check it all the time anyway. So so that's how the code looks like. How do you how do you debug this? Um, you don't. You look at the results. <laughs> all right. So like like if there's a mistake, and then you you know you seg fault yeah. inside of the, inside of the JIT code. There's no stack trace. Oh, inside the JIT code. Yeah. Um, well, eventually you get good at it. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't All happen. Right. So, you, so you, you're just reading assembly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Takes a while, but but yeah. I, I mean, we we had this in our system before. We abandoned it because you know I, I have students. I don't have you. You you generate intermediate code and then compile it. Yeah, we, then, we 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 now do okay. what MCO does. Ah, uh, it. Uh, th it's still a huge difference. So I worked on Postgres 11 after they added JIT. And, yes. and um, before they, they did the JIT, they have the same thing. They, they generate the, um, some code, some, some intermediate code, Postgres mm -hmm. specific intermediate code. And when they do that, and I try to convert that from into uh, what we have, and it's a bit slower because um, their model doesn't let them use registers, right? So, so in which case, they, they're always reading and writing into memory. So each step is, is reading and writing into memory. And, so and uh, the way my, my, student, my PhD student, Prashant here, he can tell a little more about it. The way we get by with that is um, we, instead of jitting everything, you do have to pre-compile primitives, sort of like vector-wise. And those things are super optimized to take advantage of SIMD. So you, you, you avoid some of that jitting of everything, like the entire query plan that, like that, that you guys are doing or what the hyper guy did in, uh, in Germany. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It takes, yeah. But the, I would say we, part of the reason uh, Prashant did this change away from what you did is it's for engineering purposes that like, I, do, I, I have a rotating cast of students not very yeah. few of them can actually work on this kind of code. Yeah. Well, we, 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 <laughs> this is just, you know, the, the arithmetic part, right? We even have the whole hash table written in. Of course. Yeah. The hash table. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and the, and the uh, overflow mechanism in it as well. Hey, so this is, this is Prashant. Um, so there were, a, there were a couple of reasons why we, went away from doing this type of direct IR cogen. Um, one of them was because it's very difficult to debug. And uh, another reason was also because compilation times can be quite significant. So for ah, small yes. running code, um, you may generate a lot of code and that kind of negates the benefit of, of cogening. Mm -hmm. So in the new model, we always generate, we always generate code, um, but we don't generate a lot of MIR, we generate a higher level IR that's efficient to, to generate and also efficient to execute. And um, over the course of time, we'll, we'll eventually just compile that using LLVM. So we have this tiered approach. We, so we get the benefits of compilation and the benefits of debuggability because we have an intermediate representation. So you can step into, G, into GDB and... Um, I think we have uh, essentially the same thing, but not, not here, but in the uh, FPGA stuff that I talked about just now. And, those are those have a, a higher level instructions. And then one additional thing that uh, I was free to mention is because he has this interpreter of the opcodes before you get into the, the compiled LLVM stuff is um, if you can actually start running the query uh, using the opcodes and then when the compilation is done, you slide that in. Like that, the hyper guys have a paper on this last year. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's crazy, but does it work? <laughs> oh, it works, yes. Well, I mean, we don't have it in the full system yet, but it works in Prashant's experiments. You can slide it in? Okay. It's... Yes, because it's, it's just a function call, right? A function call, okay. It's a bit different. Well, our function call essentially is the whole query. No, but like, like, like it would be, you're reading blocks of data. So, so here's the function call for a given block. You call it I that see. function. And so is, the, is, that, is that invocation of the interpreter or the compile code? I see. Oh, so for each block, you can restart. Yes. And, yeah, interesting. Okay. Okay, there's... 
I, you know, your, your thing makes money, ours doesn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool, awesome. Yeah. Um, so here's a little bit of Q1 uh, code gen uh, that we talked about just now um, in Greenplum, right? So you have you scan the line item, you go, you bring it to the egg, and then there's redistribution mode that move tuples to to um, I don't know, group them together based on the, those four flags, right? You want to egg them, and then you do the egg, and then you have the gather to send everything to the master and then you emit them, right? Um, so each segment will send four rows to the master and then the master will um, act. So that's why we see, you know, there's not much network traffic, and but it, there's still network. So speed up on PG uh, was 8x when there was no network. And when we added the network layer in, in Grim Thumb, it, you know, it went down to five times. So LLVM and all this code gen stuff is very sensitive to, to speed of the underlying IO, right? So if you have slow disk, you know, don't even bother code gen, right? So, so that's what you, you can see it quite apparent here. Okay. Um, here's Q5. So we joined six tables with three broadcasts. Um, for some reason, Greenfarm didn't think of support, have fully replicated tables from the beginning. Uh, I guess the reasoning is, you know, if the, if the table is small, we just, the, 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 the broadcasts would be cheap, right? But it, it's still, uh, it, it makes sense for Greenfarm, regular Greenfarm, but with the LLVM speed up, you can see the impact here, right? So uh, the speed was five times faster on Postgres. And here we see it about two to three times faster uh, after all this redistribution over the network of data. How much is like is Pivotal actually actively, actively maintaining Greenplum? Like, um, like they're, they're, they're doing mostly the, the, the merging. Okay. Um, I think the effort is in catching up to Postgres 12 now. Okay, so 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 the the latest version of Greenplum will have the 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 basic limited JIT compilation of like the expression that Postgres added. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's mostly <clears throat> it's mostly um, a lot of TP stuff that they're they are adding. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, the, you know all this the Postgres improvements doesn't really address OLAP, right? If you look at the hash join code in Postgres, uh, it doesn't overflow. It doesn't have spills. It doesn't support spilling. <laughs> I, I was amazed at first. Um, so here's Q17 where the boom filter um, really makes some, make a big difference. So you have an, um, <clears throat> you scan the line item, you egg and redistribute them, and you egg again before you put push it to the hash join. <clears throat> and here, when you scan the uh, part table with a very heavy filter, and you build up the hash table here, you are able to push down the bloom filter to the, to to this egg, which would um, eliminate a lot of the traffic coming up here, and then you will see a, a big improvement in in um, speed up. This is like nine, nine X faster and it's not, it says very little. I think originally this was about two times and with the bloom filter, it goes down, goes up to five, nine times. So uh, code gen, you know, makes a difference, but something like this makes an even bigger difference. How often do you see that for the, for like your real customers that like the bloom filter makes a huge difference? Um, very, very. Often, right? Okay. Usually, usually you have a pretty heavy filter somewhere, and you can just avoid a lot of the scans, especially on the line item on 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 it, the fact table. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So here are some something about fact tables that we picked up along the way talking to customers. Um, so. Uh, Greenplum has um, 
this I, this thing where um, you can have a partition that's the parent and you can have child children partitions right and each of those each of those could be either a row table or column table or you know or even a packet table on s3 and you can mix and match them and you can you know merge them or um, depending on on your workload right so the row tables may be accessed may be you know written very recently so you just keep them in row store and then every quarter every month and you move them to a column wise table and then every end of the every quarter you move all the column table into an a, a quarter table on packet in s3 right so a lot of the customers are doing this because when you do scans and you're in only interested in tables in this year then you can avoid going to s3 at all right uh, you can just use the most recent tables um, better for caching and uh, cache awareness right so this is this is pretty good and this is what uh, most customers are using especially for fact tables um, the other thing that we picked up is transaction is bad right so um, some of our customers have uh, fact tables that are generated in the factory at the assembly lines right so the machines would just generate csv files and push them up to to s3 and <clears throat> you want to scan those files and it's not controlled by you right it's just the file name matches some pattern uh, they can appear, appear and disappear anytime. Um, but if we were to copy the CSV files to the database table and we do the import into the database, that's a lot of work and that generates a lot of locking issues uh, and the bottleneck in, in, in the database. So the external table really helps here. You just have a, <coughs> excuse me, um, you just have a, external table definition that points to a URL and then you and then you know you call that URL to get the data um, so the whole table becomes like a service to you I mean, that, that certainly can mess up like query planning right because like you don't know how much data you're actually going to read so therefore your join order could be all in a whack the data the query the it actually um, provides statistics so there's a, 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 a statistics API as well for for the query plan to obtain statistics on the SMT. Right, but, but but if the files can appear and disappear at every time and you don't run analyze, your stats could be getting way off. Yeah, you still have to run analyze on, okay. um, from time to time. But fact tables distribution don't really change a lot. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the, the worst part. <laughs> so parquet, if you look at the definition, uh, I, you know, if you, if, you, if you find a C library, let me know. I've been searching for that forever. And um, there's no C library because they, they have so many dependencies. And the, um, um, the documentation doesn't have, I, I, I just don't understand why, why you have a storage document, uh, storage format. And there's no byte level documentation. Right? There's <laughs> it's, it's crazy stuff. Um, and then the, the, the dependencies is also, you know, there supports multiple algorithms, and each algorithm may not compile to the platform that you you run on. Right. And then you they use thrift and then they have um, nested fields, and it's just adds a lot to to something that we don't don't use. Um, so we actually created something simpler, and we have essentially the same design as Parquet, but it's it's uh, a lot simpler. It, you know, we do LZ4 only, and essentially every time you create a column, <clears throat> we would LZ for it, and if we if we save more than forty percent, then we store it in LZ4. If we don't, then we just store it in native format. <clears throat> Why forty percent? That's just some arbitrary number. Okay. Yeah. Or yeah. If, you know, if it, I think if it's don't save more than thirty percent, 
doesn't make sense, right? We just store it in the regular form. Sure. Because you're, you're going to pay to, to deserialize later. Um, and then we support primary types only, no nested types, no, no arrays, no nested fields. Uh, we still support zone maps. So that library is, is pretty good. And we may look to open source it later. What is that called? Sorry? What is the, what is the format called? Simple packet. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> oh, so, it, so it's a subset of parquet. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. It's, it, it, it took some design from parquet. It's not actually a subset, you know, but um, the, the, the design of the file is uh, essentially the same. In, in, the, in, in the big pictures. Uh, a clarification question. This is Panos Chrysanthes from the University of Pittsburgh. So this parquet is compatible with the standard parquet, so it can be read by Impala or Vertiga, or is no. just no. Uh, on the design? Only design. Okay. Yes, okay. The, design, the design and the idea is the same. Okay. Thank you. And you know, we support <coughs> Um, vector vectorize uh, filters on uh, out of the box on on those columns. Right. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> ten minutes on FPGA. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so FPGA has a lot of compute power, but it's 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 attached to the PCI bus. Um, so you're you're going to do a lot of packing unpacking. <laughs> so so um, so you know usually we would have the CPU pack the records, send it to FPGA. The FPGA would need to unpack, compute, and then repack the results, send it back to the CPU, and the CPU would unpack the results. And you know, most time is doing all this packing unpack unpack pack. Round trip, right? So it's a lot of lot of work. Um, so sending it's all because we're sending data to 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 the compute engine. That's that's a problem. The whole thing. Um, we view the FPGA basically as a chip that you can create your own instruction. So you know, think about a Intel instruction that takes only two registers, right? So here you can make uh, instructions that take a vector of you know. 10 megabytes of data and, and do everything and then send it back. It's very wide instructions is what, what we call them, right? Um, so, we, so we sort of use it in our regular joints. It speeds things up by a little, by um, maybe two times even compared to LLVM. Um, but if you add in the cost of the FPGA, it's, it's kind of, uh, hard to swallow. So let's see. So if we do a join like this, um, where you scan the line item table twice and do two hash join. Um, so what we do is we, we during the hash join, we, we, well, it's not a hash join anymore. So my co-founder Feng actually invented this, right? So you took the records from the left side, you send to the FPGA to compute the hashes, and that's very fast. Just send the key, key and index to to the key and index to the record to the uh, FPGA, and it will compute hashes, and then it will sort them. And then so what you get back is a sorted um, list with index, and and there are corresponding hashes, and then you do the same thing to the right side, and ready to sort the both sides. And then you can merge them, right? So the are, are, you, are you doing the sort in the FPGA, or the FPGA is only computing hash? Yeah, yeah. How much faster is like the FPGA hash versus like you know the XX hash three? Um, it's very fast, right? So there are two things here. So number one is it's faster because I. I, I it's not code, right? It's it's circuit. Yeah, yeah, but, but you have to send you have to send the data down to the FPGA. Yeah, that's the problem. That's I said before. It's a packing yeah. unpack. Yeah, at at some point the the equation shifts towards the, the computation. Yeah, uh, if you have big enough, 
And the second thing is compute is never enough on the host. So if you can shift those to the FPGA card, you can do more on, 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 on the Intel chips for other queries, right? Uh, okay, all right, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. that's really not for, not for the current query because you're, well, yeah. I guess, if, yeah, 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 okay. Right, yeah. It's, it makes sense to, to, to do this. Interesting, okay, cool. Yeah, so when you merge, then, then you get the results of the join. That's one usage that, that we implemented. Um, second one thing has to do with the sp spatial join. <laughs> so here's something from a customer. Uh, it's, a, it's a telco, right? So they have towers. Each tower have a polygon of the areas that they cover. And you know, every night they want to count how many of their customers' uh, cell phones uh, sum up the cell phones that are within the area covered by the cell towers. And so, that, so now this reduced to a, a, um, a spatial joint of a polygon and points within the polygons, right? So we tried to do, do this in, in uh, Green Plum and, and you know, it never finished, right? We used PostGIS and has an artery and now you have to do a nested loop join using an artery and <clears throat> whenever you see nested loop join in, in Green Plum, never finish. Hash join is, is, the, is the only thing that really, really works. Um, so instead, what we built some custom thing for this customer where you know, we, we scan all the towers, we build an in-memory filter, right? So you have a very coarse circle that covers the polygon. So it's something like, it's almost like a bloom filter. Uh, you would qualify more, 5% more than than you would. Um, you would probe and disqualify records that um, would never fit these polygons. And then you would send, pack up the records and send it to FPGA to do the final uh, pruning for each polygon. That's how. So, so th 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 does this, your customer stuff that gets invoked when you, instead of calling the post GIS intersect function, or that's like some other different SQL, you know, special, you know, Batiste data SQL stuff you've added. We give them a, 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 a function that they can got, call. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's this. So yeah, it's about 50 times faster after, after we do this. And yeah. So FPGA is, is pretty useful. <laughs> it's just, um, it's um, just very hard for computer science students, I mean, who code to know the hardware stuff. And, and I, I don't even really get into it. It's pretty tough. Um, so all this is because we get help from Xilinx, right? So, you know, we, we tell them what we want and they, they give us a function that we can call and, and use it. Well, so, 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 so Xilinx wrote all this, the, the, the three bullets at the bottom. The, no, the, the last the, the, bullet. At the bottom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah got it, sure, yes. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. I mean, have you thought about the, I mean, I don't know how, how hard it would be to, to replace the entire PostGIS API with, you know, Batiste magic? Um, don't, have a customer, don't have a customer yet that asked for that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we are, we are, we have very limited bandwidth. We, we do what customers ask. <laughs> of course, of course, yes. Um, so yeah, so what I see really exciting in, in, in the horizon is this computational storage uh, card uh, from Samsung, right? So it's FPGA plus storage in one card. Uh, and then the storage could be four to eight terabytes. You can plug like 12 of them per machine. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of computation and a lot of storage. So each card has um, CPU and memory. So I think they have about four gig on, on each card. So essentially, one, each of these cards is a pretty pop. It's a, it's a MacBook, right? With <laughs> storage that you can you have it in, in your in your machine. Um, so now you can really push the compute to the disk, and we uh, and and you cannot go any lower than than that. Um, 
so our idea is to you know let FPGA run egg on each on each disk, uh, but because of the limited memory, you cannot scan the whole. You probably don't want to do the whole thing in, in aggregating. You may you know do it until you run out of memory, and then you send the partial egg to the to the uh, CPU that the CPU computes it right. Com com uh, completes the the partial eggs. Um, yeah, again, you know, the nightmare scenario is the packet files, and there's no way, no way in hell <laughs> we can get it working in in FPGA. Well, right on time. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, again, so we, every, you know, we'll, we'll do virtual collapse or whatever. Uh, so we have time for a few questions uh, for CK. So again, just un unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're from. So maybe I have a question related yes. to the FPGA part. I'm Lin, I'm a PhD student here. Uh, uh -huh. Very interesting talk, right? Like uh, many uh, interesting topics. And, and one thing I'm curious about FPGA is that like you you, you made one comment uh, in, an early, in an earlier slide. You say that the compute is never enough on the nodes you want, want to have um, FPGAs to kind of like offload the compute, right? So what I'm wondering is that, well, if you say the compute is not enough, then if you can, you, you can add more CPUs, right? You can, you can add more more cores, right? I mean, then you can also com get compute that way. So I'm wondering, this yeah. need for FPGAs yeah. because it's much cheaper yeah. or like? Yeah, so that's the that's a good, good question. Uh, it's, it's not so much a computer science question as an economic question, right? Mm -hmm. So we, Whenever we try to sell this solution to customer, um, you know, each of those FPGA card could be could cost like seven to ten thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And the question is always, um, you know, you have an MPP, right? And why do I want to add card? Why don't I just add a machine, mm -hmm. right? And so, so that depends on customer, and also depends on. Uh, some customers have very limited um, data storage. I mean, sorry, the uh, data center space, uh, heat wow. issue, and all these things, right? So they want very compact things. Uh, then you, you, then, then it's worth it to them. Mm -hmm. right? And the second thing is sometimes they use the FPGA cards for other, uh, other usage as well, right? So maybe they are doing. Uh, deep green DB. I have something on my website where you know they, they do something like deep green DB on video images that they need to decode uh, and run some machine learning um, um, image recognizer on on those uh, files, those MP4 files as well. So in that case, you know they would opt for for uh, FPGA cards. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe a, a, another minor question. Mm -hmm. Wondering, um, is the word deep in deep green has anything to do with the popular deep learning here? <laughs> no, we just we just pick up that it's some words that uh, it's a name that I think deep um, Luke uh, the CTO ex CTO of Green Plum thought thought of and uh, we thought it was cute and we just just use it. Sure, sure, I was just joking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Anybody else? I, I also had a, a question. So this is Prashant. I'm a, I'm a PhD student as well. Um, so on your last slide, you touched a little bit about FPGAs. And I think of, towards the end of the, the last few bullet points, I think um, I'm inferring that you, the idea you have is to synthesize um, Per query, you synthesize some FPGA blocks based on the query that you're seeing. Is that is that right? Uh, so, no. So, okay. so so Fung did something <coughs> that is essentially a stack machine, uh, something like a fourth. I think that's what he said. That you could just give it instructions. Uh, uh, you know, think of it like a, a schema, scheme or list machine that you can just give it instructions and it would just. Uh, it's it's a simple compute um, engine. I see. Okay. Yeah, okay, it's something like, like what you guys did, right? It's simple. It's instructions that 
that are, that are that are meant for computation, but uh, at a higher level than LLVM. Mm -hmm. Okay. And stack machines push yep. left column, push right column, add. <laughs> yep. Do most of your customers are running? Are they running on premise or are they running like on, on EC2 or Azure? Um, all sorts. Okay. You, I mean, in recent years, do you see a trend moving towards like self-hosted Greenplum in the cloud versus on-premise, or just it's still all random? Still random, still random. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the 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 selling pitch from a cloud database is not really the functionality of the database; it's the convenience. Mm -hmm. right? So you know, you don't need to hire your own DBA. You don't need to hire. Uh, you don't need to move machines. You don't need to do start and stop machines, and, uh, all this stuff, right? But I mean, there's no, I don't think there is a green plum as a service, right? It's either someone running themselves on prem or again on Amazon. Um, yeah, it's it's essentially a rental that you can, you still yeah. need to start and stop. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, green plum needs, needs administration. Um, it's a complicated piece of software, right? So. So the reason they can open source is it's because it would be crazy to run this you know, without support. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The, so I mean, the impression I have is it's a very, um, you know, as, you, as you sort of said, at the very beginning, you took Thomas's paper from the hyper guy, and you're like, all right, well, this is what we're going to build, uh, you know, the column store plus the, the LLVM. But like, the, the the mesh part or that you know that you know, I guess you call it deep mesh whatever yeah. like that's certainly not in that paper. But it seems like a very like as you sort of said like the customer has these problems and it's whack a mole like all right this part's slow but how do we fix that this part's slow that how do we fix that is that is that a fair way to describe how yeah you know, how you worked on this thing yeah because we have no choice right it's a it we we are not a fresh start but like, you know in in a university right yeah uh, we need. Yeah, so we need 100% compatibility, and all we can do is to swap things out that are uh, that still maintain compatibility. So I guess my question would be uh, like, um, is there anything that, even though it's not being driven by customer requests, is there anything that you, you look at what Greenplum how it exists today mm. that you say, all right, well, if we had if we could fix one thing, because th this would be you know this would make a bunch of queries go faster or, or make our lives easier. Is there anything like that? Uh, no, I think I think if if I have the bandwidth, I would do Snowflake. <laughs> so. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, like, wouldn't we all, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any last questions? Things we are not that hard. We can talk about it, uh, Eddie, if you are interested later. <laughs> I have a short time. <laughs> so. Since uh, Andy brought the market space, uh, what is the reach of uh, Green Plum? I saw that you run on Alibaba in uh, the AWS. Yeah. Does it mean it's China and the United States, or you have reached uh, uh, Europe and other places? Um, we we don't reach into we don't have the bandwidth to support Europe, but I think in any countries where uh, you do um, um, on on prem solutions, that it's pretty popular. Uh, with a lot of uh, uh, local, local small businesses uh, coming up and claim that they support it, I, I think you see it a lot in in Russia as well. Russia is especially um, pretty good at this. Russia, China. Uh, but I, I guess another way to think about it is like, like, what is the is the sales process for you guys? Is the people coming to you after being exacerbated with pivotal support or trying to support make people go faster? Or is it like, again, or is it people like, are you actually selling, hey, you're using Room Plum, we can make your five effects faster for you? Like, is, um, it, is it more people, is it more people, do you find that more of your customers are showing up your website and think, oh, I want this because I, I have Room Plum problems now? No, it, it, well, we have, we're such a small company, we don't have really good marketing. So okay. not many people know about us, okay. right? Number one, uh, we do have customers that come that have. Uh, performance problem and, and knock on the door, um, but uh, a lot of the stuff has to has to be sales per, salesperson going to to the customer because uh, okay. customer doesn't know that they ca it can be faster. 
Sure. Right. Yes. Yeah. The customer thought this is already the best that they can can have for open source. Yes. I'm, just, I'm doing a quick test to see what happens if I search for green plum acceleration. Yeah. What's the, what's your oh thought? yeah. So here's another story that you guys may find interesting. So a lot of the customers are doing batch jobs at night. So you know, think of this as you know, banks and security firms, and they every night they have to import files, uh, do ETL. And then they have some windows to run X, and if and then they have to update the dashboard at 7 a.m. Okay, so the window is is pretty small, and you know if you can relieve two hours of the window, that's huge. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, huge. yeah. Just, all right, so just googling green palm acceleration, you don't show up. <laughs> yeah, I know. We need, we need a lot of help there. Yeah, come on, that can't be that much for that ad, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, All right. With, with that, guys, uh, again, let's thank CCAN, you know, virtually uh, for doing this. We really appreciate you spending the time with us today and talking about this.